I don't know what I believe anymore. I'm going to put God on a shelf because this God is not helping me out. But I'm just going to put all of that aside and I am going to forge my own path because the only person I can ever depend on is myself. What is it that you're doing? And she says, I, I'm a stripper. And so I'm like, okay. And now the whole place is going wild, which is crazy. And so I'm having fun. I'm laughing and everyone's just cheering and I'm getting that validation again. And I ended up forging this um, professional relationship with a uh, photographer for Playboy. He just said, you're, you're my muse, you're my discovery, and I'm so proud of you. And he really took me under his wing. Hef himself is re requesting that I get tested to do Playmate. And so I get called to do this incredible job in Louisiana, and it's for the Mardi Gras issue. And I printed things um, with their, they had their logo on the front, and I printed things on the back. And one of the t-shirts that I made was God Loves Playboy. You can be a whore <laughs> or be a model or be an actress and still serve God. And I felt like what, what a powerful way to do that, it's, which is so demonic and so twisted. But I didn't realize it because I was so deceived. Hi, welcome to Touching the Afterlife. I'm excited to have my friend Julia with us today. She has been through a lot in her life and, and started in the beauty world, becoming a teen model, as well as going into being a former stripper and being in Playboy. And the Lord really came through and delivered her from many demonic oppressions. And she's here with us today to share her powerful testimony. Julia, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Julie. It's such a pleasure to have you. And I would love to start out with um, maybe when you became Miss Teen Chicago, and that kind of started this entering into the beauty world. Yeah, I, I, there was like an advertisement for a beauty pageant. And I know that Marilyn Monroe and all these girls that had gotten involved in the acting and modeling world started out that way. So it kind of inspired me. If they could do it, I can do it. I'm just going to try. And I entered in this contest and I ended up earning enough money to not only pay for my fees and everything, but to get my dress covered and then and actually have tickets. And so I begged my mom, please come to this. Please support me. I, you don't even have to buy a ticket. I've got it covered for you. And she decided last minute, like halfway through my pageant, I saw her kind of come in with my little sister. And um, she saw me win the pageant, which was insane to me because I these girls had, again, professional stuff and I didn't have a lot of money. So my dress wasn't very expensive and I just didn't have the glitzy stuff, but I won for some reason. And I was shocked because I really didn't have that polished pageant. You know, if, if you know the pageant system, girls who have been doing it for a while, they know exactly how to walk and talk and smile and do all those things. I didn't, I didn't have that, but for some reason I won and I was shocked and my mom was shocked. And um, yeah, that was just the beginning of me I wouldn't even say I've always been a girly girl. So for me, it's just natural to like hair and makeup and all that stuff. So that's that's kind of natural for me. But I feel like the thing that I got addicted to was the the accolades of feeling important because my life was so dull and so um, unsupportive in my household. And and I was kind of like a joke in the home. Oh, there she is doing her crazy thing. Oh, there she is believing in this and that. And um on stage, for some reason, these strangers believed in me. And that gave me a lot of confidence. And I felt like that was a drug that my heart really needed to feel validation, mm -hmm. that I wasn't crazy. And um, yeah. yeah, that I was not, that I was important. Right. There was a lot of validation there, like you said, that you didn't get at home at that yes. time. So after winning that, what did that do for you? And what transpired from there? I just felt like if I could do this, anything's possible. So I started to, I've always been a dreamer and I've always like, I, I, it wasn't vision boards in the time, but I would create vision boards because I had a dull life. I would read books all the time and I would fantasize about a better life and what I wanted to create for my life. And I just wanted to get out of where I was at. And I grew up in a very, it was very conservative, very Christian and I had those values in me. I really did love the Lord. I had experiences with the Lord when I was young. As a child, I, I heard, um, I got saved at four years old and I had an incredible encounter with God when, at four. And um, I wanted to serve him. I wanted to be a missionary. So there was these 
these dualities going on in me. I, I had a desire to know God, a desire to serve him. And then I also had a desire to get out of my situation and to live a life that was beautiful and hopeful and and full of joy. And so there was like this combination of, of desires in me. The pageant system, it just gave me um, a template for success. And I ended up using the pageant system over time, several times. And so I was Miss Petite Illinois, and then I ended up doing Miss Hawaiian Tropic and winning, you know, Miss Hawaiian Tropic Chicago, and then, which was a huge pageant. And then we ended up going to Hawaii. And then that's where I met Playboy. So uh, that was the template of success for me was just doing these, these little pageants. And for some reason, I kept winning them, which to me, it was crazy because I'm very small. I'm petite. I'm 4'11". And usually for the pageants, you have to be pretty tall. And I would just work around it and, and wear, <laughs> train myself to walk in really tall heels. Um, I leaned out so I would photograph taller. And um, I just kind of worked with what I had. And um, it ended up being um, a way for me to get out. And so I um, end up going to this hair show. And I was 15 at the time. And mind you, I was very sheltered as a child. So I was more like an 11 year old because my, I wasn't allowed to go out and do things like normal kids. And we only had 35 people in my graduating class. So the situation was, it kind of made me a little backward. And so at, at like, imagine 11 year old going to, to, a you know, a hair show and then meeting all these 21 year olds and stuff like that. So I, I met all these older models and one of them was a really attractive man. And he was, I think 19 at the time. And so imagine like 11 year old in the head with a 19 year old. So this, this guy really liked me and they chopped all my hair off, which was super embarrassing. I, I went to like having like a buzz cut. So I had this long hair, they, they cut all my hair off and I'm just humiliated, I'm on stage. I, I can't cry because I'm in front of all these people but I'm just devastated and embarrassed. And he keeps hitting on me. I just thought after my head, hair was all cut off, he would be like, oh, see you later. But he still kept you know, hanging out with me all day long. And one of the things my, my mom said was to my dad, because my dad was the one who dropped me off. He said, um, she said, make sure that you follow her and that you pick her up and that I'm, I'm really worried about her. And my dad left me there for so long, they had shut down the show. And I was, they were cut, you know, cutting everything down, all, all the props and everything were being moved out. And I was in this parking lot waiting for my dad. And this model was with me. And he had this really cool sports car. And he's like, you know, oh, where's your ride? And I'm like, oh, my dad is supposed to pick me up. I don't know. And we didn't have cell phones at the time. So I was just waiting. And this guy waited with me for like two hours and was hanging out and, you know, we, we were laughing and having fun and he was kind of putting me at ease. And then, you know, he got me to give him my phone number and I had never given anyone my phone number before, but we started, he started calling me. And so he started working on me to go out with him. And eventually I had never done anything like that before. I eventually snuck out of the house and met up with him. And then it became a sexual manipulation situation. And I was kind of stuck out in this car, didn't know where I was. And he would do these very like mentally abusive things. He would say stuff to me like, well, you're ugly anyway. I don't know why I'm wasting my time. You're so immature. And, um, you know, I'm going to go see beautiful girls. I'm going to go to this strip club called the Admiral Theater in downtown Chicago. And uh, I didn't really know about strip clubs, but it made me feel really ugly. And uh, he kind of planted a seed that I wasn't good enough and pressured me in a way to like earn his love by doing things. And it made me feel awful. And I hated myself. I'm going to cry thinking about it. It was awful. And I remember um, going home that day feeling like I was a different person because of what he was doing to me psychologically and sexually. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. I'm so sorry, Julia, that, that you were treated that way. And uh, it sounds like he was, it was a course of mental manipulation and even triangulation with the strip club. Yeah. Which eventually the enemy used. Yeah. In your life. Yeah. Oh, so over time, um, 
sorry. Um, over time, I didn't realize it, at, you know, because time had time was moving on, and I uh, eventually got out of that situation. But I um, never was the same. And my mom would say to me, "What is? Where's my little girl? Where? Where's my happy girl? You were the dreamer. You were the hoper. I was always bopping around. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to take over the world." And and all of a sudden, I just went in my shell, but I couldn't tell anyone because first of all, we didn't even have sexual education at my school. And um, we were just told to, you know, avoid everything. When I didn't even hold hands with my boyfriend in high school. So I, I was so overwhelmed with the guilt and the shame. I couldn't go in. I couldn't go to anyone because my school would have kicked me out for doing these things. And um, so I just felt like I had to keep it inside. And I, and I did, I buried it. And I just uh, buried it deep inside and tried to move along as best as I could. And, and then I get to the point where I have to go to college, where I want to go to college, actually. And my parents couldn't afford it. And they didn't encourage me to go. They didn't really want me to go because they couldn't help me. And, and so I just said, you know, I'm going to figure it out. I, I did it for the pageants. I'm going to do it for this. Just ignorantly, just, you know, moving forward. And I had a learning disability that um, was... It was, it's kind of complicated, but um, it's called dyscalculia. And it has to do with space and it has to do with numbers and it's switching things around. It's a spatial thing. And um, so I, I, I had trouble with math, a lot of trouble. And so I basically in college, I just kept failing 098. I couldn't even get basic <laughs> algebra. So um, I just kept retaking the same stuff and I could see my, the bills were stacking up. I wanted to move forward. And for some reason I couldn't move forward on the most basic class. And I was beginning to question if I should even go to college because now I'm going to go into debt and I'm, I'm struggling in this area. This is costing me money to have this problem. So I just didn't know what to do at that point. And um, so I was struggling with the whole school thing. I um, went to a college that, um, so imagine going to a college when you had never really been to a real high school. So 35 people in my graduating class, and now I'm at this huge university, and I'm exposed to the world in a way I have never been exposed to before. I hadn't listened to rock and roll music at this point. I wasn't allowed to wear jeans. I, it just was such a culture shock. I wasn't it to, even told about you know my sexual organs or anything about sex at all. I literally had zero education on that. And now I'm in this college campus. And so, and then I'm physically getting lost every day because of this learning disability. So physically I can't find my classes and I'm late to my classes. And I'm just a nervous wreck. My, my anxiety is through the roof. I'm, I can't sleep anymore because I don't know how I'm gonna pay for this. I don't know how I'm gonna find my class. I just, I'm so confused and lost. Um, I was the oldest of five and I was kind of put in the position to help my mom out and, and be her helper and be like her husband or whatever. I took the role of a parent. So deep inside, I was just angry. I was angry at my parents. I was angry at my stupid learning disability. I, I was a hard worker. I was trying my best. I, I wanted to serve God and I just felt lost and abandoned by God. So at this point in college, I had gotten exposed to sociology, which is you know, something that I'd never heard of before, but basically it's just opening your mind to all, all other things. You know, I grew up in a private Christian school where I learned one ideology. And so now everything's an option to me and I never explored other options. And I thought, this is what I need to do. I, I don't know what I believe anymore. I'm going to put God on a shelf because this God is not helping me out in any way. So it, it might be this childhood fantasy, this ignorance of how I grew up, but I'm just going to put all of that aside and I am going to forge my own path because the only person I can ever depend on is myself. And so that's, that's what I ended up doing is I just put God on a shelf and I said, God, I'm angry. It's not that I don't believe that you exist. I believe you don't care. And I'm going to figure this out. And then one day I'm going to serve you, but obviously I got to take care of myself. So um, I, that was just in that mindset. And I met this girl on campus and um, she, I was telling her about my stress and like, why I'm so worried. And she said, why are you so worried? Like you, you can make money easy. This is what I do. And so she had a fancy purse and she had her nails done and she's enjoying life, which I totally wasn't. And I just wanted her chill vibe. I was like, what is it that you're doing? And she says, I, I'm a stripper. And so I'm like, 
Okay. Um, you know, I've done stage performance before with, with my pageants. I was in, into drama and acting. So I thought, okay, you know, maybe this, I could just think of this as an acting role. She invited me to do an amateur contest with her. So I end up going to this amateur contest. And the crazy part was there was about 20 girls that were not amateurs. <laughs> they literally had tassels and, and glitter and they had all the all the, the tall shoes and everything and I literally was wearing bare, I was barefoot I had come in with gym shoes I took off my shoes because the gym shoes wouldn't look good and I had um jean shorts and like a cutoff t-shirt and it was like I thought of it like an MTV you know I don't know spring break kind of thing so I had like a bikini top underneath and so I'm in this long line of you know, girls that are normal height. Now I'm literally 4'11 with no, no shoes on. So I am like so short. I'm anyway, it's, it's crazy. The difference in height. Um, and I was like, I'm not going to win this thing. How am I going to do this? This is crazy. But for some reason, I just, uh, asked the girl before me, like, what's the crowd like? Cause as a drama person, you kind of know how to measure what you bring to the table um, by the crowd. And so she said, they're really difficult. So I was like, oh gosh, now I, I really got to bring it, right? So I just, you know, get my energy going and I burst through these, you know, red velvet curtains and just jump on stage. And I am like, just yelling and screaming and jumping up and down, hoping that people don't notice how short I am. If I keep moving, they're not going to notice. And so I'm just jumping up and down and I'm telling one side of the stage, you know, this side's yelling louder, come on, beat it. And I get a war going on in this strip club. And now the whole place is going wild, which is crazy. And so I'm having fun. I'm laughing and everyone's just cheering and I'm getting that validation again, you know, so it feels good. And at that point, I, I go backstage and I'm like, well, I don't know what happened there, but I had fun and um, I end up winning the contest, which is it's still insane when I think about it, because these girls had all the fancy stuff and I just showed up and was crazy and I won. And um, the, the owner of the club came up to me and he said, if you would have done a bad job, we would have given you your 500 right away. But you signed a contract and you get 250 now and 250 on your first day of work. And I said, wait a second. You didn't tell me that when I, you know, when I entered and he said, yeah, but we really want you to work here. We think you'd be a really good fit and, and we're going to give you free house fee for uh, a week. And so I didn't even know what a house fee was, but in every strip club you work at, you have to pay to work there. And it's about a hundred to 150, $200 a night. So that's what ends up happening. What ends up happening is if you don't make that money, you owe that money the next time that you work. So it's a real racket. It's a it's a trap. But what happened is they wanted me to get addicted to the money and make sure that I made money and had time to figure things out. So they gave me a full week of no house. And so I had never in my life made that kind of money before. I people were throwing money at me. I didn't even take it bathroom break if I if I could help it. So I just kept just, you know, was on the floor making so much money. And then when you're doing well, the other girls don't like you. So I'm at this club and I'm just, you know, killing it. And now I'm creating enemies because of my desire to survive and just and just do well. So I learned in the strip club, unfortunately, that there are no friends. And over time, you know, friends would do some really horrible things. And yeah, so um there's a lot of scars from the strip club with, when it comes to, it's very interesting. The scars from the strip club that came weren't really with men at all. Like I love men to this day. I, I've never had a problem with men. Men have always been kind. And, and I think they're, they're, uh, they're more compassionate of the sex, to be honest, but females have been a, a very, a, a problem for me, friendships and, and maintaining friendships. It, it feels like um, being vulnerable with females is hard because when I've shown my vulnerability that has been leveraged against me in such a, such a way. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I don't know where I'm going with that, but yeah, that reminds me of when you talked about the female that you did befriend and then she kind of turned on you. So I can understand. Yeah. You... yeah. And it wasn't just her. There's a few, few other situations, but it, it just was like, okay, I learned how to not only forge my own path, but to be on my own. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to live in a box. So as a stripper, what ends up happening is you live very isolated life. 
you because you can't you really can't make good solid friendships that you you know you learn how to just be on your own like when I was doing Playboy I hardly told anybody I, I told a few of my regular customers and a couple of the dancers found out but I pretty much kept that to myself because anytime a girl would find out about something, she would try to sabotage you. Even if you had a boyfriend, if, if people saw your boyfriend, they would go for that. And so I just learned to not trust people and to just, you know, live in isolation and keep everything to myself. And it's really a sad existence because when you start to make it or when thing, good things are happening, it's just natural for us to want to celebrate with other people and for them to share in our joy. Mm -hmm. And even when I was good, things were happening. I was alone in all those things. And I felt, wow, this is just so unfulfilling. And I am a people person. I'm a girl, girl's girl. I'll have your back. I'll pray for you. Like I love my girlfriends and it's, it's, they say that you get what you give. And I, I just was like, that's not true. I mean, I'm really giving myself to my friendships mm -hmm. and I'm getting hurt in such a way, but I had put myself in, a, in in the devil's playground. You can't go in the devil's playground and think you're not going to get burned. It's, there, that's the system that's set up. It's set yeah. up to hurt you. Yeah. And unfortunately, like you said, that's a, a tough system and they're not always kind. And yeah. so... So after I've been working at the strip club for a while, I, I was still modeling. So I was legitimately doing modeling work, going out on auditions and and getting offers and stuff like that. And um, I ended up uh, still doing the, I, I ended up doing the Hawaiian Tropic circuit. And so um, back in the day, this was a, a while ago, over probably 20, over 20 years ago, um, there was a, the, this contest called the Miss Hawaiian Tropic contest. And it was a great way to get exposure and to get contracts for like suntan lotions and other, other things, anything to do with bikini stuff, which is all the modeling work that I was getting at the time. So uh, somebody had recommended me doing this contest and I did it. And it was a very, very difficult contest because you had to go um, a lot of different local level competitions and you had to go to five or six local competitions, beat all those, and then you would win your state. And so I did that, won the state and ended up being flown out to Hawaii. And I met Playboy out there. And um, one of the judges said, hey, we have an office in Chicago. We'd love to see you come in for a test shoot. And I ended up forging this um, professional relationship with a uh, photographer for Playboy. He just said, you're, you're my muse, you're my discovery, and I'm so proud of you. And he really took me under his wing and believed in me, which for me was a very powerful thing because um, he, you know, I was a, a dancer at the time and, you know, you're used to guys kind of coming at you sexually. And even though this was a, you know, kind of sexual environment, he, he was very professional. And I, I appreciated that about him. He was like, he actually saw me. He actually loved my personality. And he said, I, I just want you to succeed. And he never hit on me and never tried anything. And he just kept saying, she's my girl, she's my girl. And he would claim me as his discovery. And for me, as a girl who had a father that literally made me feel like, like I, I was nothing, to be claimed by somebody to say like, I'm so proud of you. I actually want to put my name to your name. That was oh, everything to me. So I loved this man, like, like, like a mentor, like a fatherish type of figure. And I wanted to make him proud. And so I just really loved Playboy. I felt like I had that fatherly type of relationship with this organization. And they treated me so well. I mean, they treated me like a princess. I would walk in and you know, whatever I want to, for lunch. And, and I, I was just being pampered. And it's funny, a lot of people say that they feel God in nature. And the crazy part is, I've always felt God in the spa. And, and um, people laugh at me when I say that, but there's something about feeling like a princess. And I think it's because if you've been treated like a pauper, and that's how the Lord sees us as his princess, his, his, daughter that he wants to lavish love on us. Um, I was being lavished in that way. And it awoken a part of me that always felt like I was worth more than I was being treated, you know? And um, so it was something that I worked for and worked really hard in this company for three years to move up. And so I did magazine covers. I did calendar covers for them. And I was doing a lot of work. I was voted fan favorite at, at uh, one year. And um, 
Yeah, so I was moving up, but I wasn't getting Playmate. And what happens is if you are a newsstand special model, um, they usually didn't bridge the gap. So because the newsstand specials was a little more, so it, was thought, it was thought of as a little more salacious than the regular magazine. And it was just because they had a like a system, like a template, like hot girls in bikinis and um, barefoot beauties and stuff like that. So um, anyway, in Playboy, they have a certain image and they want what's called is the girl next door. And so if you've already done their publication, a lot of times you can't become a playmate because you're not really seen as fresh, right? You've already done that kind of work. And so it's a little hard once you've been established to move over to becoming a playmate. And I didn't realize that working for their company, I didn't know this till like three years in. I was like, oh, wow. So did I did I um, work against myself by working so hard and so long and, and establishing myself in this way? And now they can't see me as, as fresh or, or usable for the magazine. But it ended up happening. Long story short, Hef asked for me to be tested, which was phenomenal. So now I'm finally getting this chance to get Hef himself has re requesting that I get tested to do Playmate. And so I get called to do this incredible job in Louisiana, and it's for the Mardi Gras issue. And so I get flown out to do this incredible job. And I'm thinking in my heart, I'm so excited because I've been saving up and saving up and trying to get out of dancing because I know there is there's nothing good that's going to come out of this. So I had a game plan to buy an apartment building and to have like a six flat unit and to rent out, you know, and live in the apartment building myself and be able to take care of myself outside of dancing. And so I thought this would be great. I get that playmate paycheck. I can sell the car that they give me. I can put it into this real estate. So I already had a plan and I was so excited about this plan. And I was excited about getting the chance to serve God because I felt the darkness in that job. And I had, as a child, like I mentioned, I heard the voice of God. I had a relationship with God and I missed him. I really missed him. And I was like, okay, God, you know, I figured it out. I, I finally figured out our plan. <laughs> where I can serve you now. I had to do it. You couldn't get involved because you weren't helping me out. But now I know I can I can do this and I can serve you now. So I actually designed Playboy. Um, you know, they sent us out there and they gave us all this uh, Playboy clothes, whatever clothes we wanted from their catalogs. They had a catalog at the time. And so I got to pick out clothes. And what I did was I cut things up and I sewed things up and I printed things um, with their, they had their logo on the front and I printed things on the back. And one of the T-shirts that I made was God Loves Playboy because I wanted to be the one girl that was actually a Christian that was in Playboy like and was proud of it and, and would talk about God. And I thought because the whole time that I was dancing, I, I never drank. I didn't do drugs. I didn't go home with customers. I didn't let guys touch me, which is why I think I don't hate men because, you know, if you do those things, I feel like it ends up creating a... a you know, resentment. So I thought, okay, God, you know, I've been living my best in this industry for as long as I can. And now I can finally say you can be a whore or be a model or be an actress and still serve God. And I felt like what, what a powerful way to do that is to use this platform to do that, which is so demonic and so twisted, but I didn't realize it because I was so deceived at this point, you know, of my life. And um, what ended up happening was I um, get out to Louisiana and I remember getting off the plane and literally feeling, and some people are really sensitive in the spirit and I, I am sensitive. I remember getting off the plane and feeling things hit me. Like, I think they were demons just hit me and it was taking my breath away. And I'm like, huh, this feels weird. And I, I literally felt a little drunk, a little off. And mm -hmm. to the point where when we got to the, the hotel, I was like, I, I think I need to lay down. I, something doesn't feel right. And I just kept walking around the hotel going, I feel like, I don't feel like myself, but I put it aside as just jet lag and excitement. Um, at this point, um, I'm sorry if I'm going off on a tangent here, but I had broken up with my boyfriend because I had found out he was cheating on me with my best friend. And this was like a day or two before I had gone on this trip. So I had I had just, my world was crashed down at this point. I'm, I've been supporting this man, financially supporting him, 
and um, he's cheating on me with my best friend. I had given this guy my virginity. So to me, this was extremely devastating because um, that was not a light decision for me. And now I don't trust my own instincts. I, I'm like, I let this woman this close. I met, let, met this, I let this man this close. Like, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with my meter? Can I even trust my own instinct anymore? So I'm, I'm kind of dealing with that, but pushing it down because I cannot deal with it <laughs> in this point of my life, in this point of my career where everything is beginning to open up for me, right? So this job that I've been working for for three and a half years is finally coming to um, this, this point where I can be this playmate that I've worked so hard for. So I'm trying not to think about it and I'm pushing in the back of my head. And now I, I get off this plane and I've got this weird feeling in my body and I just count it up to stress and jet lag. Okay, you're just tired, you're stressed out. Just take a little nap. So I take a little nap and then I end up going to their dinner. So I get ready to go to this beautiful dinner and I've never been to a five course you know, restaurant before. And it was this amazing restaurant in the French Quarter and they were serving several courses of wine and I never drank. So I, I would, you know, they passed me the wine. I'm like, oh no, I'll just take water. And I could just see the look of disappointment on everyone's face. Like, come on, you know, like get with the fun girl. Like, and I just, you know, something inside of me said, you know, why, why not? I, I mean, I've been the good girl this whole time. I have not really crossed my own boundaries. I've, I've, I've supported this guy. I'm, I'm a good friend and, and, and nothing I'm doing, it, it even matters because it's not paying off, you know, everything is just a dumpster fire in my life. And so I said, finally, I'm just going to relax and have fun. And what's a drink? Everyone drinks all the time. I've never drunk once. So what's a drink? So I tell the dance, uh, not dancer, I tell the other model, I said, you know, I've never drank before. Like, and she said, just, just take it easy and, and drink some water in between then. And so I start drinking and I feel so good. I'm like, what am I? What have I been doing my whole life? Like, why didn't I ever try this before? Because for the first time in my life, I didn't care. You know, I was like, wow, you know, I just don't care. And I was thinking about my problems and they just weren't a problem anymore. I'm like, whatever, you know. So I thought, wow, this feeling is like good. So I just kept drinking and um, I got buzzed, didn't really know it. You know, I just remember going to the bathroom and looking in the mirror and going, I don't feel like I'm the same person. But that had happened earlier that day. It was this, the being drunk was almost the same feeling as I felt when I got off the plane, when all those things were hitting me. It was kind of like the same feeling. I was like an out of body, like a little bit separated from reality feeling. And I was like, wow, this feels so good to not be in my body fully. And so I, we're walking out of the restaurant now. So the meal is finished. I'm totally buzzed. I can't even really walk very well. I'm kind of dragging behind our, our group. And there's a guy that's standing outside the restaurant and he is smoking something. And he says to me, he just, he sees me stumbling. He says, Hey, you want to hit? And I was like, why not? I mean, a stranger, I would, I'm a germaphobe. I would never grab something that somebody sucked off of and, and done anything like that, but I wasn't in my right mind. And so at that moment I saw this seems like a brilliant idea. Let's just do it because I am just going to lean into everything that I haven't done up until this point because what I have done is not working. So I take a, a hit of whatever he gives me. I have no idea what this is. This could have been, you know, fentanyl or whatever, but I go flat. Like I'm literally like, you know, stumbling now and my my group catches me and they're like, they're like what are you doing talking to this guy like what what was he saying to you and i said oh never mind and so we just move along we go to the club and we have these um beads that we're supposed to give out and t-shirts we're supposed to throw out we had this whole promo tour that night and i was crashed out for the whole thing they had two bodyguards carrying me from every event now i was known at playboy to be the most responsible model so now here I was the most responsible model, always showing up on time, always being professional, always treating people well. Now I'm just laid out. They so unprofessional. They're dragging me around to all these things. I'm out of it anyway. So then they drop me off in my room. And um, the next day they wake me up early for my shoot. I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm completely out of it at this point. And um, 
yeah, so I, I get up at this photo shoot and the crazy part to me was there was a lot, like there was a three vignettes. So there was three other models there or two other models there. And they had like a, one scene was in a Louisiana swamp and that was totally um, another girl's vignette. And, and mine ended up being something that I always fantasized about. As a girl, I always fantasized about those vintage makeup tables. I just loved that with, you know, the Marilyn Monroe kind of situation, the Greta Garbo, like you just pictured all the Hollywood stars getting ready in this beautiful mirror. And I was like, oh my gosh, like they set up a vintage and I love, I love vintage. I love historical architecture. And they had me in this old hotel in this beautiful vintage setting. And it was amazing. And so it's interesting because God knows your dreams but the enemy knows your dreams as well. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very surreal experience. I was like, wow, this moment feels like I was meant to be here, you know? And then I was also completely wasted still. So I wasn't in my right mind anyway. So they start the photo shoot and they're, I'm, I'm so out of it. They're actually have, they actually have me recline as they're doing my makeup. And they say, just relax, just rest. And so I'm resting. And I get up and then the photographer starts to direct me. Hey, Julia, we're going to take this puff called Kama Sutra honey powder. And I want you to, you know, put it on your body and I want it to be from the side. So the puff of smoke, you know, is like this and it kind of gives this really heavenly look. And I was like, okay. So as soon as I puffed the puff, that smell and that taste hit my senses, I went down. And I, I honestly believe that this stuff is demonic. It's called Kama Sutra honey powder. I think the, there's witches praying over it because whatever that was, was just the final thing that hit, hit me. And, um, it was just too much. And so I fall on the floor and I'm kind of manifesting. I don't really remember, but all I know is that everyone around me is freaking out. My experience is just seeing everyone acting weird and I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. And so, um, everyone's frantic. They're kind of leaving the set. I'm, I'm there confused, like what's happening. And then they grab me and they, they throw me in a car and, um, end up dropping me off at a mental institution. I didn't know it, but, uh, all my friends were there in the car and, you know, they're, I was asking them, where are you taking me? What's happening? And, um, and they, they weren't talking to me. And so as soon as I get to this place, um, the nurse says, you know, we'll tell you everything once you sign this paperwork. And I said, oh, OK, so all I have to do is sign. I have no idea what I'm signing. I can't even see straight still. I'm still out of it from whatever I took the night before signing this paperwork. And as soon as I sign that paperwork, everyone I know is out the door. They're gone. And so I'm like, you know, they lied. And so now I'm abandoned again. And and the the guy that was like my father figure was one of those people. And he had abandoned me. So I'm like, I, I don't know what to do. So now I'm, I'm completely disoriented. You know, my situation with being lost all the time. And now I'm in this place with people I don't know. Uh, I'm in a state that I, I'm not familiar with. I have no idea. I'm rocked out of my mind. So now I'm just spiraling. And they, the lady says, you're going to be here for a little while. You need to take this. She gives me a cup of pills. And then they I'm taking this couple of pills like every day and I'm completely out of it the whole time. I don't know what I did. I can't tell you honestly what happened in that hospital, but I was there for a while and my mom, I ended up coming to pick me up. Playboy somehow got a hold of my mom and she flew in to ca catch me and get me. And um, it was weird because when I saw my mom, it kind of reoriented me. I, 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 finally realized who I was. Cause at this point I didn't even know my name. I didn't know anything. I didn't know. I, I, all I knew was playboy. That was the last thing that my mind was focused on. And that was the only thing I really knew I was there to do playboy and I forgot who I was. So she kind of reorients me to knowing who I am. And then I'm like, Oh gosh. And it's hitting me like, Oh, I just, I just literally ruined my career. I just literally ruined my life. And, um, so, uh, she takes me back home and I am in this deep depression because I can't show myself at the strip club, my management and all the people that did know that I was there to do playboy. I, I was so embarrassed. What am I going to say? You know, I, oh, I did not only did I not get the job, like, oh, I was just in a mental institution. Like I didn't even know what to say. 
So I, um, I stopped eating and I couldn't sleep. I lost half my hair. I went down to 75 pounds. I sold all my furniture except for my mattress. Just, just didn't want to live anymore. Didn't have the guts to kill myself, but literally had no will to live because I, I, you know, couldn't trust my own instinct anymore. I had done all the work, everything I knew that I could do to be successful and it still didn't work. And so I was just a broken person. It was bad. So, um, yeah, that happened. And, um, I had one friend that reached out to me and she just kept pursuing me and she actually just showed up one day and cause she kept calling and I wouldn't answer the phone. And she just showed up at my apartment one day and said, Julia, oh my gosh, I, she couldn't believe what I'd become. She says, this is awful and I'm scared you're going to die. So she literally slept with me that night. She was crying and holding me. She's like, don't give up, don't give up. And it was like the next day she came and she brought me this Tiffany bracelet. And she said, I, I got this for you because I, I want you to know you're valuable. And, um, you know, everything I, every nice thing I ever got was from me buying for myself it was never like a gift of kindness. Mm. And uh, it was a tangible thing that I could hold and look at and say, wow, someone actually says I'm valuable. They don't just say the words and leave. They left me with something that I physically can touch. And every time I look at it, I did feel it gave me some strength to hold on. And so um, anyway, she called my friend that, that slept with my boyfriend. And she said to her, you know, you're going to, you've killed this girl. You destroyed her life and you're responsible and you better fix it. And so um, that girl called and she said she was really sorry. And she was just crying out, please forgive me. And of course I, I forgave her. Like I, I honestly wasn't, I was mad at myself. I was confused. I was so hurt and betrayed, but I really wasn't angry at her. I, I wanted to get rid of this guy. This guy was a problem in my life. It was more of like the betrayal of the friendship that hurt me more than anything. I, and I needed to hear that she cared enough to be sorry. You know, the sorry was really important for me. It's all I needed. And I forgave her. And so she said, Julia, I want you to come live with me. I'm going to put you back together. We're going to get you healthy. And I just was like, okay. Like, I just didn't care. So I was just like, okay, I'll sleep on, you know, I slept on her floor. And um, she had my goddaughter. I had this beautiful goddaughter. She was six years old and oh, I loved her so much. And, and it was funny that she had asked me to be her goddaughter because she said, you know, even as a stripper, I always talked about God. And she's like, you're the only person I know in my life that loves God and talks about God. And she, I, I'm going to baptize her and she needs a godmother. Would you be her godmother? And I said, oh my gosh, absolutely. And I took that job so seriously. I bought her her Bible and then I just took it as a mission. Okay, if I'm going to be living in this house, I'm going to be the best godmother I can. So um, I had to eat. And I had to, I had to open up the curtains because I'm living in someone else's house. I had to let the sun in. And, and then um, I had to be an example for my goddaughter. I can't, I can't not eat in front of her and be depressed. So I would put on a happy face and I would read her the Bible. And she loved me praying with her. And she would say, come on, let's pray. And at night I would do that. And it, it gave me so much strength. It gave me so much hope and so much life. And that's why I believe that we as believers, we need to be part of a community because when one person is weak, the other person is strong and we bring out things in each other and we give each other a reason to live. It was the, you know, that friend that gave me that bracelet. It was the, the love of a child, the unconditional love, the responsibility of being a godmother that called me higher. You know, I couldn't do it for myself, but I could look at this little girl and I could do it for her, you know? And so, um, yeah. So anyway, that that kind of got me out of the hole. And I'm not the kind of person that can live off of someone. I had someone do that to me for so long. I, I couldn't just take, you know, live the live there without paying rent. So it forced me to go back to work and I started to work and get healthy and I overcame the shame of it. Yes, I had to have a lot of really uncomfortable conversations. The customers that did know 
a few of them literally made fun of me. And they said, oh, we've heard in Playboy's making fun of you. I went out to dinner with a Playboy executive and you're like the joke. Um, and so that was very, very hard, but I just had to get over it because what else could I do? This is all I knew. I've been dancing since I was 19. So I, you know, went to college, I got in involved in dancing, you know, and then I got involved in Playboy, but I had to go back to dancing because it was what I knew. And I had quit school at that point because it was too difficult to keep my grades up. And, um, I just needed to pay the bills and figure things out. So yeah, that was where I was at. So you ended up going back to stripping, but tell us now about how things started to shift and you were then brought on a lot of demons came into you and, but God showed up and tell us about that transition and that journey. So I feel like a lot of demons came in me when I was 19. So remember when I went away to school, I, I had a friend that played with the Ouija board. And I, I didn't really go into this earlier, so I'll touch on it now. Um, I would play on this Ouija board with her and it loved me. So she would always want to play with me. And um, I, I thought it was amazing. I thought it was so fun. And I think the reason why people open their lives up to the occult, I, I wasn't like a devil worshiper. I didn't really, I wasn't interested in anything dark or occultish. If someone dressed goth, I was really turned off. So it wasn't really that aspect of it, the, the danger of it that, was drew me to it. It was more of the ability to control, you know, like my life was so out of control. I, I had no leadership in my life, no guidance, no protection from my family. That's, that's how I felt, felt very exposed. I felt always like I had to look out for myself and the idea of asking this board, like, what should I do? It was like, it was like a guidance. It was like a mother. It was like a father. So I, deep down believe there's a lot of people that are turning to occult activities who have grown up in homes where they didn't get support. They didn't get leadership. They didn't get the guidance. And so they go, I need it from somewhere, something. Maybe they don't have a community of friends that are walking alongside them. So they're going to grab onto this. And there was something very appealing about <clears throat> something bigger than me is moving this thing. Like, wow, that's powerful. I want to tap into that. That That is empowering, right? And so um, I, I played with the Ouija board and me and my brother um, end up playing one night. I invite him over and he's not into anything like that. And I said, no, this is real. It works. You've got to try it. Let's just try it. And so he gets on the board and the thing is just going nuts. Like it loves us. And it's not doing this in any other circumstance. It's just powerfully working through us. And I didn't realize it at the time, but we have witchcraft in our family. And so I think that was a familiar spirit that that magnetized that board even heavier. So, um, yeah, so we end up playing with this board all night and my brother, excuse me, and my brother plays with this board and I go to bed. I said, I'm, I'm tired. I got to go to work tomorrow, but he continues to play on it. And I, we don't know there's a rule that you're not supposed to play on the Ouija board by yourself. Well, he plays all night and then he ends up waking up in the middle of the night to this swirl above his head. He said it was like a portal had opened up and all these demonic faces are morphing in and out of each other. And they're laughing. They're like cackling. Ha, 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 ha. And they're they're looking at him and they're popping down at him and then they're going back and they're shrinking. And then they swirl, 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 really. And it gets to be like a whirlwind. And then they go whoosh and they go right into his head. And, the, and he's explaining this to me the next day. And he and he goes, this is so weird. He goes, I, I don't feel like myself. He goes, all of those laughing and the cackling and all those voices, they're now in my head. And I'm hearing like all these different voices talking at the same time. And they're telling me to do this and they're telling me to do that. And he gets this weird look on his face. And I had brought this mask home from Mexico. It was a, a decoration. It was a lapis stone. It was, it was pretty. And I, you know, I just bought it because I was a tourist, dumb. Well, that mask was demonic. <laughs> he just, kept zeroing in on the mask, like he was hearing something from it. And then he was looking at me and he was looking at me with such intensity and such hatred. I got scared. And my brother's a very kind and loving person. We were like best friends in high school. And I'm like, Daniel, what, what are you doing? What's going on? And he goes, oh, something just told me I could kill you so easy. I could just snap your neck and it would be over. And he goes, I, I got to get out of here. Like <laughs> I'm going, oh my gosh. So 
I'm, I'm getting freaked out, but I'm thinking, okay, maybe he's just hasn't gotten any sleep last night. So that's probably the problem. So I just tell him, okay, get some sleep. I got to work. So I lock up my apartment. He, he doesn't live with me. He was just visiting that night. Lock up my apartment for the weekend. Go and work the whole weekend. I come back to my apartment. All the cabinet doors are open in my kitchen, every single one of them. And then I'm like, hmm, that's, did, did my brother come back? Like, I'm kind of confused. I'm a little miffed. I go towards the bathroom and I had this electric toothbrush that was broken and unplugged. <laughs> and it's bouncing around inside my sink. It's just going nuts. And I'm like, what the heck? How could this even be turning on? It's broken. And then I go in my bedroom. And the crazy part was it looked like someone had been sitting on my bed. There was like an impression of a body in my bed. And my closet door was open, but my closet door couldn't easily open because it was one of those doors that was on a rail. And um, it was a big, heavy wooden door and it was broken. So you literally had to lift it up and move it to open up the closet door. Somebody had lifted up this heavy door and moved it, opened up that door. And there was a photo album, an old photo album of me and my brother when we were young kids. And we always call this picture the angel picture because there was a big flash that flashed over us. And the photo album was opened up to a picture, that very picture of me and my brother, like on the bed, laid out as if someone was reclining on the bed, opened up this album, was looking through it, and then got called to go for coffee or something, and then just left everything. Like, that's what it looked like. Mm. So I'm like, what is happening? This is so weird. But I had unlocked my door. I know, I know that my door was locked the whole weekend. So I call my brother and I'm like, did you come back in the apartment and start looking through my photo album? Like, what's happening? He goes, oh my God, I'm so glad you called me. Oh, everything, all these things are happening. I'm hearing all these voices. I go, okay, okay, did you get any sleep? He's like, no, I haven't slept. All. I said, well, that's probably the problem, Dan. Now let's figure out what happened in my apartment because this is really creeping me out. He's like, no, why would I go in your apartment? I don't even have a key. How would I get in? And I go, oh my gosh, he's right. You know, that's what I was thinking, but I needed to hear it from him. So I end up meeting up with him and he is full on demonically possessed. And so we end up trying to get help. My parents don't agree with anything to do with the occult. So we're afraid to go and talk to them and tell them the truth. But they end up finding out anyway. And the pastor of our childhood church kind of helps him out. You know, I grew up Southern Baptist. They don't believe, at least my denomination didn't believe in demonic possession. They didn't talk about it. They didn't really talk about the, um, the Holy Spirit. So it was, a, it was a very awkward deliverance. I think the Lord met my brother where he was at. So even if the minister doesn't know what he's doing, God is so wonderful. He's so kind. You know, he will even use people who are ignorant to help the ones that are coming to him, you know? So what ended up happening was I was in this, this pastor's office with my brother. We were in this together because the crazy part was while he was having his demonic manifestations, him and I were seeing the same thing. So I would close my eyes at night and I would see visions of violence that I had never, you can't even think of these visions. If you watch a horror movie, that's what it was like playing out on my eyelids. And it was just random things like disembowelment of people and, and just horrible, wretched acts being done to children. And it was awful. You could not sleep. You were just cry. Your, 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 your eyes would just start tearing up from, and you could not escape it because every time you closed your eyes, the movie would play on your eyelids. And I was seeing literally the same thing he was seeing, which was bizarre to me because I wasn't manifesting. Right. But what ended up happening, we found out is that I got possessed at the same time he did, but my demons decided to lay dormant and his demons manifested right away. So I didn't, I ignorantly, I didn't know that I had demons and we go to this pastor and he's getting his deliverance, but this pastor doesn't know what he's doing. So he's like, I don't know what to do. So I'm going to pray. So he just starts praying and he's like, God, lead me. And, and so he's looking at, he says, Daniel, Daniel, look at me. And so my brother's looking at him and then all of a sudden his head's just jerking around. And he's like, ah, and he's like, Ugh, and he's just can't look at him. And then his neck starts to stretch really long, long. And then I see something inside his neck, like here, just punching out, like trying to get out through his neck. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And now he's choking. He's like, it's pulling his tongue down and, and it's happening right in front of me. I go, you're going to kill him. You're going to kill him. Stop, stop. And so the pastor kicks me out of the room and he's like, you got to get out of here. And so I don't know what ended up happening, but 
long story short, I talked to my brother while we're driving back home. And I said, yeah, what happened when, you know, what happened? And he goes, the pastor was looking at me and I could feel love just pouring out through his eyes. And it was so intense and it felt so good. But the things inside of me kept trying to get me to stop looking because I was receiving love and it was burning these things. I could feel these things burning inside of my body. And so um, he goes, it, like, I, I had to keep looking. I wanted to keep looking, but I physically was having a hard time doing it. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's insane. So we're driving and uh, and now we're driving around and we're so happy. I'm like, praise God, this is out. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like we just dodged a bullet. We're looking around and everything looks like Technicolor. It almost looks like Wizard of Oz where it looks fake. The green was green and it was like the colors were so vibrant. It didn't look natural. And I look at Daniel. I said, how do we not notice how beautiful the world is? And he looks at me. He goes, yeah, I'm seeing the same thing you are. He goes, what we're seeing is not real. This is not real. This thing is tricking us. He goes, we got to go back. So we go back and he ends up getting even more deliverance. So it's interesting how the enemy will sometimes seduce you when you're like just getting a little bit of freedom to, to trick you to believe that you are free and you're really not free. And so my brother ends up getting a deliverance and then he gets connected with another deliverance um, ministry that really believes in deliverance, not, not a guy that doesn't really and getting help. And to this day, he really won't talk about it. He's been traumatized by what happened to him. So He's he's free. He's living for God. He's uh, working at a church. So he's good. But um, fast forward, I still have them and they're lying dormant in me. And, you know, I'm working in this industry where literally at our job, we would have what's called a house mom and she would make us food. She would fix our dresses. Um, she, she just would, you know, provide us care at, at our place. And I think they they call her house mom to uh, very strategically in a strip club because a lot of these girls don't have families, right? So they want to create what's called a system, like a family. Like, come to work. We'll be your family. Come to work. House mom will make you food. Come to work. She'll give you a hug. You know, so these girls are kind of getting something more than just work. They're getting the warmth and the community and the family that they need. So the house mom at our work also did card readings. So she would make a little extra money on the side. When things were slow, girls would say, read my cards, tell me who's going to come in tonight and all this kind of stuff. So she did it for me a couple times. And I remember one time right after she did it, my sister called me and I was taking a break at work and I'm like, hey, what's up? She goes, what are you doing? What are you doing? The demons, there's these dark things in my room and, and, and I know you're doing something. And I'm like, I'm not doing anything. And she's like, well, whatever it is, I know you're doing something. Please stop it. And so I was like, oh, that's weird. So I never did it after that. But my even my sister could feel the forces. And so, yeah, like little things like uh, I had a dancer give me an evil eye bracelet, you know, and a lot of times girls will gift you things and you think it's they're them being kind. Right. You think, oh, this is a gift. This is kind. Something kept telling me, don't put it on. Don't put it on. I put it in my locker and then eventually, you know, I just told her, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not wearing it. It, it broke. And then she bought me another one. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, Oh gosh, you know, and something told me, don't put it on. Don't put it on. I, I said, you know, I, I can't, I can't wear this. Um, I'm going to give it back to you. So I gave it back to her. And there was another girl at work that she would, she would go through girls um, um, brushes and combs and take their hair because she was a witch. And I know she definitely did not like me. So I would hide my, my stuff to make sure she didn't touch it. But you know, how, you know, how much are you going to be able to watch those kind of things when someone has their eye to do something, they're going to figure out a way to do it. So we had witches that worked at my job. And so un I knew that my friend that had cheated on me with my boyfriend, I knew that she was involved in witchcraft. But a lot of people at my job were, and I was on her good side, right? So she was my friend. I had helped her get all her friends because people were afraid of her until we became friends. And then once we became friends, all the other strippers were like, oh, she must be pretty cool because she's hanging out with Julia, right? So she got a lot of friends. Um, and um, yeah, so she ended up making a lot of friends through me, but people were scared of her. 
when when I first met her, she was wearing all black. Everything was very goth, kind of scary. And she was into Santeria. And I didn't realize how bad it was until I moved in with her. So when I was going through my crisis and she invited me to live with her, I, I'm staying with her and her goddaughter. Love it. Right. It's awesome. She tells me, Julia, I'm so sorry for what I've done to you. I want to make it up to you. And I said, no, just letting me stay here and helping me get on my feet. And I really appreciate it. I don't need any help. I want to, I want to bless you. I want to bless you. I'm like, okay. You know, when someone wants to bless you, it's kind of rude to say like, no, you can't bless me. <laughs> so I didn't want to hurt her feelings, but she's like, I want to, I want to give you um, this healing session with my mentor. So her mentor was her boyfriend's mother. She was a witch in Santeria and she lived in this basement unit of their townhouse. And it's crazy because they didn't own this unit, but she literally chipped through the concrete floor of this unit, destroyed the foundation of their unit so that she could have a dirt floor. I don't understand the logistics of it all, but I know in Santeria, there's something about a dirt floor that's really important, being connected with the energy of the earth or something. So she invites me to get this healing session. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I'm just like, oh, healing session. Okay. So you know, thinking maybe like a massage, you know, where they do the little woo, -woo and I'm like, okay, maybe that'll be something like that. No, it wasn't that. I end up going downstairs and she tells me to change out of my clothes and to wear these certain clothes. And I'm like, okay. And then she says, get ready to reserve your whole day with me. You're, it's going to be an all day thing. You're going to have to sit all day. And I was like, okay. So she sits me on this dirt floor. She blindfolds me. She's putting these, like, it's weird, this thing on my head. And it feels very heavy. It's like a clay thing. And I'm like, and then she's wrapping my head in this headdress and I'm wearing all white. And then she, I can hear a chicken. And so like, it's like running around me in a circle. She, it, and she's like chasing it. I don't know exactly. I can hear the squawking and, and then I, and then the noise stops. And then all of a sudden I feel this warm sensation just covering me and it, it's blood. You know, I, I can't see it, but I feel it. It's warm blood. And I'm like, oh God, oh God, what is happening? Like, None of this was explained to me. I just thought I was in a healing session. So I'm I'm getting this heaviness and this fear is is kind of arresting my heart. And um I go to the bathroom because she says, Okay, now you gotta wash up and you gotta clean off and you gotta wash with certain things, salts and all this weird stuff. She keeps giving me all this stuff, and then she gives me these beads. And then she says, We are inviting you to be a priestess. You have a gift on you. And um, this will be very powerful when you enter and what we're doing here is going to be powerful, but you have to accept the invitation. So I, she, I grab her beads and I'm washing up in the bathroom and this sorrow, this deep sorrow comes over me. And I'm like, what am I doing? I got, I got blood on me. And I'm like, that moment I go, this is so wrong. God, how did I get here? I know this is not what you want. And I don't want to hurt my friend's feelings. So this is the dumb part of my story is just this overarching theme of being a people pleaser. This is how I gave up my virginity. This is how I let bad people in my life. I didn't want to hurt their feelings. Oh, they have no friends. I'll be their friend. You know, it's like I was just a garbage dump for being, you know, for these people. And I'm like, I cannot accept these beads because I want to be a people pleaser. There's just something rose up in me that... It, as nice as it was for her to offer this gift, I cannot take this. So I come out all washed up and I, and I immediately, she said, say to her, I, I can't take this. And she goes, no, 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 you got to think about it. You got to, got to think about it. Give it, a, give it a few days. And I said, I did think about it. And I know right away, I just know I cannot take these. I don't even want to touch them here. Please take them back. And I'm so sorry. And I really appreciate everything you did for me, but I cannot take them. So I give them back to her. And rem remember, her son is the boyfriend of my girlfriend. Mm. He was an amazing person. He was a, a guy that I knew at the strip club. He was a bouncer and he was my friend. So a another person in my life that did not look at me sexually, treated me like a sister. I always felt safe around him. But he was in this occult thing, too. And he always told me, you're going to do something great in your life. I can feel it. He's like, you know, I have a gift. I have a very strong gift. And he's like. There's something different about you. And I walked out of the bathroom. And when I told him I can't do this, he looked at me, he smiled. He goes, 
I knew you couldn't do it. I knew this wasn't for you. And he says, he, he, he wasn't mad at me. I mean, he was entrapped in this. And I would think that, oh, no, he's going to be disappointed. He's going to be, he said, I knew you couldn't do it. Good for you. And so I was like, wow, that's weird. So anyway, another person, when I look back at, I feel like the Lord used in a powerful way, even though he wasn't a believer, his words and um, his confirmation that I was on the right path. So yeah, that, that happened to me and I moved on. Right. So I, I start dating my husband and we go on a couple dates and this woman sees him picking me up from her house. And, um, John had just done the cover of muscle and fitness. So he had given me, he had all these magazines in the back of his car. And I said, Oh my gosh, can I have one of those? He's like, yeah, sure. So I take it and I go upstairs and I'm all excited. Like this is the guy that I'm seeing, you know, and she looks at me and she just gets this look of like complete anger. And I'm like, Oh God, no, no, it's happening again. You know, she had done this already with my ex boyfriend, And it's like every single guy that liked me, she would try and go for because I dated another fireman between John and, and yeah, same thing. And, but this anger was just overtaking her so much. She couldn't control it. And so she ends up locking me out of the house, hiding my clothes, like won't talk to me. Now imagine you're living in a small apartment with three people. And I mean, in this tiny apartment, so I'm the fourth person and, and one of them is not talking to you. The wall of like, um, rejection and, and, and discomfort. It was, it was very, very heavy in there. And so I was getting scared because I didn't know what else she was going to do because I knew she was involved in this witchcraft and she would do certain rituals and blessings to make a lot of money at work, you know, and, um, she was very successful at her job and, you know, she was trying to convince me to do it for that reason. I said, no, no, I don't care. You know, I didn't, I, I cared about making money, but never to the degree of doing something I wasn't uncomfortable, whether that was witchcraft or whether what that was some guy um, trying to touch me or some guy trying to talk dirty to me. It's like, no, oh, God, no. So I just had a strong sense of absolutely no. So she tried, you know, she would do stuff at work to get money. So I was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm scared. Like, is she going to cast a curse on me? Did she, ca was she the first person that cast a curse on me that ruined Playboy? Do you know, I, I wasn't sure. I thought she was a trusted friend, but she also slept with my boyfriend. So what the heck do I know? You know, I'm um, just all these thoughts are going through my head. And I say to John, I'm scared for my life. And he says, I, I would be scared, too. And why I'm telling him the whole story. I hadn't told him at this point because we, we were just starting to date. I don't want to tell him. Yeah. You know, I hit the mental institution for a little while and, you know, didn't want to live anymore. You know, I was getting out of that. So I just wasn't going to go to that dark place. And finally, I was at this, this spot where I had to explain why I was scared of where I was living. So I need to find a place to stay. So he helps me out. I get out of there. But long story short. Yeah, that that's how um, deep the oppression went. <laughs> and and that's how. Yeah, that's how the enemy kind of used friendships, used relationships, used my situation. You know, the enemy will use any vulnerability that we have. And that's why I feel like it's so powerful to work on the things that we are struggling with, the insecurity of not having our identity. I needed to find my identity in him. And that's where I began to learn the people pleasing was actually demonic because it makes you feel like you're a good person if you're making everyone happy but you're not following the leading of the Holy Spirit. And he says, if you're not with me, you're against me, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're going to go to the fear of man, then we're not going to have a fear of God. So that's where my life was. It was constantly in this battle of, you know, listening. He, uh, you know, the Lord had rescued me from so many situations in that job. There, and I don't know if you even want to get into it, but there was a time that I could have got raped. There was a time where my, um, yeah, could have got yeah. raped. You, you had, the Lord was protecting you this whole time. And so why don't we just talk now a little bit about you, you and John became serious. You, you got out of that living situation with this yeah. woman, you cut yeah. ties with her. Tell us about what happened next. And then these demons that were lying dormant are going to show up now, aren't they? Yeah. So they, they manifested when I went to Louisiana with Playboy. And so what ended up happening is John and I get married and we are living this great life. We've got this double income. We've got this goal to get an apartment building. Now he's sharing my dream. We are so in sync. We, we think alike in so many different ways. And 
Um, how I met John was actually, I have to give, I have to share this part of the testimonies because I, when I was a little girl, my Sunday school teacher said, pray for the person that God has for you. And I did, I was, I was about eight or nine years old. And she said, and pray specifically so that when God answers that prayer, he gets the glory. And so I did. And I had this list as a little girl of what I wanted. And I said, God, I want a guy that looks like Superman. And I want a guy that's smart. And I want a guy that's funny. And, and then, you know, as you get older, you know, I went through such a horrible circumstance with my ex, you know, I continually updated this list, whether I was walking with God or not, I upgraded my list. Okay. <laughs> this guy cannot be of this political persuasion because, you know, two ideologies cannot merge and live. I mean, it's very hard. So there was this list started to get ridiculous. So my mom would say to me all the time, that is crazy. Everybody settles like you can cannot ask God of all these things. And I said, God knows what I want. You know, I, I I'm, I'm tired of everyone like hampering my dreams. Like I, I'm not going to be a whore, but I want to work in Hollywood. I'm not going to be this, but you know, don't like, I am very creative and I'm an INFJ. So my mindset is always like, think outside of the box and come in a different way. And it, things don't have to be the way everyone says it is. So that was just like, no, I always believed that God would answer that prayer. Even when I was not walking with him, I just felt in my spirit. This was a huge part of my story. And so, um, yeah, over the years, I prayed for this man. And now I meet this man and he is a gentleman and he is another model. And I've met and, and gone out with other models before. No, John is so different from any guy that I've ever met. He he just has such integrity. He has such compassion. And, you know, so he he carried all the inner qualities. And then on top of it, cherry on the top, I'm completely attracted to this guy. So it was just like, wow, John was not living for God. John was not even saved. But I knew in my spirit, I'm not even living for God. So I'm a, I'm a stripper. I get married to him um, because it, in my mind, I'm not I'm not religious but I believe God sent me this man. So marry this guy. We're doing great, making great money. And um, yeah, proceeding forward. Uh, one of So we had a situation where a young friend of ours died of a heart attack. It was very sudden. It was very unexpected. We had just seen him and his wife like a week before, and then he, he keeled over. And so that hit me super hard because he was around our age. It was between me and John's age. And so in my head, I was thinking this could be either one of us. So John was away on a business trip and um, I was alone in our place and I was really depressed. The depression just hit me very, very hard. So I went out and I said, you know, what do I do when I'm sad? I like to shop. <laughs> so I went out on Michigan Avenue, bought a bunch of things that I can't even remember, come back home. And I still feel this empty, sad feeling inside. And um, something says, go read your Bible. And I'm like, read my Bible. <laughs> Why would I read my, like, it's been years. I don't even know where to start in that thing. And something just says, go read your Bible. And I get a vision of where it is. It's in the bottom of my bookshelf at the very bottom part. And there's dust all over. It's in his box. It's brand new. My mom had given me that Bible about 10 years before I had not even cracked it open. So I'm like pulling out this old Bible that's brand new. And I'm opening it up and I'm thumbing through the pages and I said, God, I don't even know where to start. But my mom always said, if you're ever feeling lost, open up the word of God. God is always speaking and he will he will direct you out. So she planted that seed a long time ago. And I said, OK, God, if if my mom is right, then you're going to have to say something to me. And it's just it's just going to have to be the luck of the draw. So I opened up the Bible and I just put my finger down. And it was in it was some verse that said, I think it was in Mark that said, if your eye offends you, cut it out. It's better to go into heaven with one eye than to hell with two eyes. And I was like, oh. I felt like that was my job, that the Lord was really fingering my job because I had a love for God. I wanted to do the right thing. All of those things were in me, but it was leaning on that job, depending on that job to rescue me, to, to, to be my savior, you know? So I was like, oh, okay. I didn't like what I read. So I just said, okay, God, I'm going to give you another try. And I did the whole thing again. And I put my finger down and it's like in Matthew, if your hand offends you, cut it off. It's better to go into heaven with one hand than to hell with two hands. So I'm like, ooh, gosh. So God is, it's like God says, no, no, I meant that for you. And instantly all the like 
putting things away and putting things aside and not dealing. I go, oh gosh, God is actually speaking to me. And I just start to feel like I'm not alone. Like there's something here. I'm not alone. I'm, I'm actually in a room full of people now. I feel like all these eyes staring at me. And then something says, call your mom. And it's like three o'clock in the morning at this point. So I'm like, I'm not going to call my mom. Why would I? That's crazy. Call your mom. Call your mom. I feel that very strongly. So I go into my bedroom and I'm like, you know, my mom would be happy to hear I'm reading the Bible. So I call my mom. I said, mom. And then all of a sudden, oh, I hate you. Just starts ripping through my body. This just anger, guttural, demonic voice. And it's just growling and hissing at her. And my hands go to the top of the bed. My feet go to the bottom of the bed. It's like I'm being tied up by this invisible wire or something. I don't know what's happening, but now the the, the phone is at, at my side and I'm kind of like, mom, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what's happening, but I didn't mean to say that. I'm so sorry. And then this little girl's voice comes out of me. Mommy, 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 save me, save me, save me, help, help. And then this other voice comes out and all these voices are coming out of me. Excuse me. And the room is getting so hot. It feels like the walls are on fire and they're pressing in on me. And I feel like a thousand eyes just, it's like they're all staring at me and I can't get out of this bed. I am literally locked down. I can't move. Something is holding me and it's not hurting me. I can't see it. And so I'm, I'm like, mom, help. And she goes, Julia, stay where you're at. I'm going to get help. I know what's happening because she recognized the manifestation and all the different voices from when my brother was manifesting years before. So at this point, I think I'm about, uh, I'm maybe about 30, 31 ish when this happened. So, you know, my brother manifested when I was 19. So it's been years, right? And so I'm manifesting and then I'm waiting for her. I'm on this bed for three hours, yelling and screaming at the top of my lungs, we live in a downtown condo that's got thin walls. You could hear our, our neighbor shutting his bathroom door. That's how thin it was. I'm like screaming at the top of my lungs at three o'clock in the morning. There's no way that someone's not going to call the police. There's no way that that nobody is going to knock on my door and find out what's going on. So it, it was weird to me. Three hours of intense screaming. It was so bad that I lost my voice for two weeks after that. It was raw. It was just destroyed. So that's going on. Finally, my mom shows up with this pastor, the same pastor that did deliverance on my brother, the one that didn't know what he was doing. And he looks at me and he takes one look. He goes, oh my gosh, she's insane. I can't help her. And my mom goes, no, no, no. It's the same thing. You remember what happened with Daniel? He goes, no, no, she is crazy. Cause I had snot coming out, just dripping down on this t-shirt. I mean, I was a mess. And so when they came, um, the crazy part was, I, I need to explain this. I get released about 10 minutes before they come. Somehow I get released. I don't know how it happened, but I did. And I'm rushing to the bathroom because I've been holding it for three hours. I rush to the bathroom and I can't even get myself ready because they they knock on the door. So I've just got this t-shirt with snot and my, my face is just destroyed. My eyes are beet red. My, it, it, my skin almost looks like a scaly kind of look to it. It's, something doesn't look right. I just don't look normal. And so he says that to me. My mom says, don't listen to him. I know what's happening. I'm going to get you help. And so he left. And um, yeah, so then my mom took me to her house and she laid me out in, in her basement because I was violent. So the, these things kept telling me to bite glass. So if I had a cup with glass, it would say bite it. And it would say punch, punch your hand through that door, jump out of that car. And I had several situations where I actually did those things, drink this alcohol. And I would just chug, I chugged a whole thing of Listerine because I, I mean, I was out of my mind. These, these things were telling me to do things. And, they, and the way that demons speak to you is they say, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. And it drives you crazy to hear it over and over again, that you literally think the only thing that will shut them up is if you do it. So when I hear about people that have committed suicide, mm -hmm. I know it's a spirit because this spirit was telling me to kill myself all the time. And it was it like, just to kill yourself. Oh, it, it wanted me to self-destruct. And I would, I would actually say out loud, I don't want to kill myself. I don't want to kill myself. Stop telling me to do that. So my parents are like, she's crazy. Oh my gosh, she's going to kill us. You know what I mean? So when someone's talking to themselves, but the, but the reality is they just 
tell you to do stuff that will end up killing you, jump out of the car, jump, 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 do it now, do it now, do it now. Now's your chance. And so it's like, you want to shut them up and then you just do it. So I jumped out of a moving car one time and yeah. So, but I didn't want to kill myself. I just wanted the noise to stop because it, it was just endless torment. So what ended up happening was I couldn't get a, a lot of help at churches. And um, I was, I did go for deliverance a few times. I found one church, but John wasn't a believer. My husband wasn't a believer, so he didn't want to go and he didn't want to take me. And so I would beg my friend to take me and I would manifest so bad that it was embarrassing to my friend. And I could see that and I felt bad. So I felt one day the Lord tell me, you, we can do this on our own. And I was, I was like, what, what do you mean we can do this on our own? You don't need to go and get deliverance. I can help you. And I said, are you serious, God? Like, how, how are you going to help me do that? Like, no, I, I don't think, I don't understand how this could work. And I, he literally walked me through deliverance. The Lord himself walked me through deliverance. And so he had me, he said, uh, my word is your medicine. And I want you to take it a million times a day right now, because you have such a problem. And I said, okay, what does that mean? He goes, I want you to look up verses on unforgiveness. And I said, okay. So I, I opened up a document on anger, on unforgiveness, on all the issues that I was dealing with, on rejection. And um, the Lord said, I want you to eat that, read it 24-7. Um, so I printed up these documents and then I got Bible on CD. It was really great. The dollar store used to have this great Bible on CD at the time. And he said, I want you to fast from TV I want you to fast from radio. I don't want you to even talk a lot. I want you to be silent and I want you to feed on my word because I want to reprogram your mind. And so I was like, okay, he goes, and I don't want anything else to influence your mind right now. You need to be washed with the word. So I did 24 seven and I felt bad for John. He was not a believer. So here I am listening to Bible on CD. He hated it. And so I, I would like try and do it in a room where he wasn't in. And if he was watching TV, the Lord told me, put in earplugs. I don't want you to get even the noise of the TV in you. And so I was just reading the word. I would go to the grocery store as I'm waiting in line. I've got my document out. I'm just 24 seven as much as I could. So I'm reading the word and the Lord is ministering to my heart. Like, I want you to forgive your father. I, you need to forgive him. And so, you know, my emotions were still damaged and hurt and I'm, you know, Forgiveness is a process. It's not something you do and automatically you're forgiving that person. So it was a process for me, but it was a process of every day giving it to him. And I honestly go through that process to this day. I'm still working through a lot of this stuff, but he's faithful because he's pulling me out um, and healing me. And so he's walking me through this process. And the crazy part was in the middle of the night, I would feel my mouth open up and I would feel something stretch it out. And then I would feel something crawl out, either crawl on the side of my mouth like a spider. I would feel a hot snake from the bottom of my foot just going up and coming out of my mouth. I would feel a lump coming up from each one that would come out. I would in, be in my sleep and go, oh my gosh, that was three. You know, And mm -hmm. it got to the point that this happened every night for like two years. So and Julia, this is, this is self-deliverance that he was walking you through and showing you how to do. Yeah, so right? what, I, what I learned from this is that the word of God is so powerful. And that's the reason why the enemy comes against us as believers to read our Bible. He will put as many distractions. He'll have the phone ring. He'll have, oh, this chore needs to be done. And he'll, he'll, he does it to this day for me. It's hard for me to read God's word. And every time that happens, I know it's mm -hmm. the enemy. This is not actually the real distraction that's happening here because the Lord told me when you fill up with more of me, then the enemy is so uncomfortable. He cannot make his home in you. And so that's the thing is sometimes we slide. We just like, oh, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You know, we're not supposed to be of this world. We're not supposed to. So, but, but the world is part of our culture. So it's hard not to get affected by that. And so to kind of disinfect us from the culture is filling up on the word of God. And that is something that we need to do on a daily basis. And it's I like that. that disinfect us from the culture. That's good. <laughs> Yeah. And so it keeps us clean. And mm. so he was telling me that a lot of times people look at the word of God, like, oh, just read your Bible. Well, no. How about you read your Bible with some strategy? Mm. You know, read your Bible with some intention. What are you looking for? What are you looking to get? What are you looking to believe in? And what are you looking to declare over your life? And so now the word of God is not some nebulous book of history or someone's genealogy. Now we're going in with intention. We're going in to, to say, okay, God, if, if David was a man after your own heart, let's look at the life of David. 
What did he declare when he was depressed? You know what I mean? And now we're going in with a strategy. So it's not just about deliverance. It's also about the joy of the Lord and the freedom. And right. It's so, like deliver to remove, but then fill up with what he wants you to fill up on. Yeah. Yeah. So he, so he took me through a season of deliver to remove, and now it's a different season of deliver to, or to fill up. And so, um, yeah, so it, to me, the word of God is really precious. And it's the only thing that we have as believers that's going to set us apart from the world. Because, you know, um, there's a lot of good self help stuff out there. There's a lot of good stuff out there, but nothing has the power behind it but the mm -hmm. word of God. And a lot of the things that are actually helping people are based on biblical principles. So if mm -hmm. people were to go back and see the source of where that actually comes from, it comes from God's word. It's just been tainted and twisted and marketed as something else. And so even as believers, I, I don't, I, I like to still look at things with an open heart and an understanding that God can even use things that are ungodly, you know, like they're, he can they use have, right. Yeah. They can, he can use anything so that people just throw out psychology is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Oh, they throw out psychology. Like it's all garbage. It's all man made. It's not. Sometimes there are things that God can use because the way our brains are wired mm -hmm. is an actual physical thing. And we can take the information that we know that our brains are wired a certain way. And we can rewire them with God's word, you know, and we can actually have somatic experiences with God's word. So these, these things that are known to be like of the world can actually be of God and used for, for our good, you know, and his glory. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I never say throw everything out. I look at something like yoga and people are like, oh yeah, well, you're stretching and see, so God can use that. No, because that is purely straight up demonic, you know, straight mm -hmm. up from the portal of hell. And I know believers who do yoga and every believer that I know that does it lives in complete depression. They, they fight depression and, um, and they struggle with bipolar tendencies. Mm -hmm. And so what it does is it splits the mind. And so that's what I feel like the, the main thing with Christianity today is that a lot of Christianity wants to merge some of these demonic principles into what God has to say and to give people a false sense of security so that they, that they think they're okay. I can do this and love God, but if it's really getting in the way, if God says, no, you're not loving him. Like I can't sleep with another guy and tell John, I love him. You know, mm. you can't do that. And that's what people want to do with God. And God's not a fool. If my husband wouldn't accept me doing that and he loves me, if he wouldn't accept me doing that, why would God, and God loves us, but he, wants he loves to us so much that he wants to show us the right way. And, yeah. and in, in those details of no, this is an, this is an open door or, or that. And, uh, and what I love about what you're doing now is you're really, God is just revealing so much truth and there's a big gap in your story here. And I want to tell our viewers that it's remarkable after this demonic possession happened, your husband, John came home and that's a whole nother story of what yeah. transpired from there. And yeah. so he shares that powerful testimony from his perspective and you do as well uh, on your channel. So we will put that link in the description of where they can hear what happened from the time of your self-deliverance to okay. in that gap. So Julia, you are just, I, I just love your courage. Thank you so much for sharing. And I know that it's going to touch a lot of people's hearts. It's touched mine. And I just think uh, you're just such a beautiful person inside and out. Thank you so much for sharing your testimony with me today. Thank you, Julie. Would and you mind if I pray? I was just going to ask you that. And, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, yes. So let's pray together. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. Lord, I just thank you so much for what you've done for me. And people who haven't had an encounter with you could look at my story and not believe that it's for them. But Lord, I know there are women who are in OnlyFans who don't want to be there, who are mm -hmm. stripping, who are doing things that they don't feel good about God, that are destroying not only their heart and their soul, but their very identity, their very worth, God. And I just thank you, God, that you have taken me and you have built me up one brick at a time with your love, with your care, with your truth, God. Yes. You love these women and yeah. you are not judging them. You came and met me where I was at and I was a mess. And I literally at my lowest point said to you, God, I don't even know what you could do with a life like mine, but here I am. Take this mess 
And God, I'm just so grateful for the second chance of life. And I pray that over anyone here today that is struggling with believing that God has more for them. God, that you would take my belief for them, my experience for them, and that you would give them double and triple the anointing on their lives to overcome what the enemy meant for evil. God, you will use it for your good and your glory. We thank you, God, for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Powerful name. Amen.